Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and this is a Super Micro Ultra Super Server 120U-TNR, which is a bit of a mouthful to say, but as you're about to learn, it really does pack a lot of punch into a 1U server. This system is here on loan from Super Micro, so thanks to them for providing this unit for review, but unfortunately I have to send it back. I don't get to keep it. But let's jump right into the specification. This unit supports dual 3rd gen Intel Xeon scalable CPUs, has 32 DIMM slots, and can support up to 12 terabytes of memory. At the front, there are 12 2.5 inch hot swappable bays that can be configured as SATA or MVME and are connected via PCIe 4.0 by 4. The drive bays are configured in a way that six go to each processor covering the four total drives. Then we have four PCIe Gen 4 16 slots. Two of them are full height and one is a low profile slot. The eight pin power connectors located on the motherboard are what powers things and devices such as GPUs. So yes, you can pack some good GPUs into this. Power is provided by redundant 80 plus titanium powers supplies that operate at 96% efficiency and the system is kept cool by eight dual four centimeter fans, 16 of them in total, that are heavy duty and able to move a really high volume of air, but that comes at the expense of making a lot of noise. So this thing's not gonna be quiet, not at idle, and of course not at all at full speed. But it does do a good job of keeping the system cool. And when you're dealing with something as dense as this, having 16 fans is going to be really good. Now the fans are configured in a redundant array. So you have a fan at the front and a fan at the back. So you only see the eight here, but actually there's two fans in each one of these modules on here. Now this system was designed for high density applications. Like I said, you can put a few GPUs in here and uh, this makes me worried taking this out, but I will carefully do so because I'm sure the people at Supermicro are watching. But to get this level of density means we have this kind of tight fit for this riser cart. There we go. I mean, it comes out, but it's really in there good. It's kind of a dual riser cart, as you can see. I have, and this was not shipped with it. This is a separate 25 gig cart I put in here for some of the testing we're about to do. Well, I've been doing and now going to share with you on this device. And the other than this being a little bit nervous when I pull them out, it's not that bad overall to get this in and out. And the high density having the dual PCIe right here and another one over here in the back does allow you to put quite a few cards in here and the airflow should be adequate for keeping this thing cool even with the high density applications in there. Now there is an option to get this with no networking at all. Uh, currently it does have onboard network card but I thought it was interesting they had that as an option so if you wanted no networking except for the IPMI network uh, that is a way you can order the server if you wanted to be air gapped offline only for processing whatever you wanted on there. But I do have the 10 gig card installed as shipped from Supermicro but I wanted to try a 25 gig card in here for some of the connectivity. Now, the good news is this goes in way easier than it comes out. Just give it a quick push, goes right in, flip these little levers down and it's locked in. We're good to go, no problem. So other than a little bit of struggle getting it out because it's just a nice snug fit, but I think that's what you're looking for. No real worries overall about it. Um, like I said, it's the only really complaint on there. Now, I do have the plenums off on this kind of to make it look a little bit more presentable and less shiny in the lights. But uh, the two plenums, plastic plenums that redirect the air, uh, we'll go ahead and put these back on the system so we can get this thing fired up and jump into the real fun, which is the software testing on it. Now, before we put this in the rack, I wanted to show the drive bays. These are a nice toolless design. So easy it has these little pins down at the bottom here. So you can just set a drive right in and tension from the sides here just holds the drive in place, making it really easy to swap out a drive. There's all, as I said earlier, hot swap bays, easy enough to take them out, put them back in. And currently these are loaded up on this side here with these Keoxia NVMe drives. These perform really well. We're going to see that in the testing we're about to do. Now, as far as locking the drives, I will show the locking mechanism is pretty basic on these. It's just a tiny little, uh, put a flat head in there and turn it, keeps it from popping open. Not real secure, but enough to keep people from just touching and popping a drive out without having to get in there. And it's recessed just enough that this little screwdriver works, but your fingernail may not get in there to do that. 
Now taking a quick look at the back, you can see the two hot swap power supplies, the little lever to side th slide them out. Then you have the two 10 gig ports as provided by Supermicro with their onboard card that I believe there's another option one that you can get that has SFP ports here instead. This is the dedicated motherboard IPMI. Then we got the USB 3 right over here. And then we have the 25 gig card that I installed. And because we aren't really going to be using anything for the VGA. I didn't bother plugging it in, but I do like that we have VGA and serial. And a lot of you are going to be going, well, Tom, isn't it 2021 and we shouldn't have those? This is how a lot of enterprise systems are managed with still the old style connectors. And honestly, when you have IPMI, you're rarely ever plugging into those type of connectors. Anyways, they're kind of just there for now. And a lot of the older systems that I said in the data center type stuff still have, if they have any type of connectors for a monitor are still more common to be BGA. But that's not really anything I would worry about. I haven't seen that many servers yet that have HDMI. I think we're going to see this for a little bit longer for those of you wondering. But IPMI is the way we are going to manage this. And actually, that's the next thing I do is go stick this in the rack plug it in, fire up the new IPMI interface because they did some cool revamping on it. I kind of like the more modern look it has. All right, so we're logged into the Supermicro interface here. One of the things I want to point out is that yes, I'm using Firefox and yes, it works fine. There's a comment a few people had about whether or not it will work in Firefox and it will, except you will get this message if you try to launch the console for the HTML5. It works fine, but you'll get your current browser doesn't support the capability of video recording. Please use Chrome for that. So you do need to use Google Chrome for the video recording feature, but functionality wise, virtual keyboard and everything else, I didn't find anything else that didn't work in Firefox. So for those of you wondering if it works in other browsers, I works except for the video recording feature. Now we're going to use this in Google Chrome, but I also want to point out a weird problem I ran into, and that is uBlock Origin. I had to disable uBlock Origin for this site because when it first loads, it just kind of spins and not all the elements will load. I assume it doesn't like some of the scripting that it's using, but turning it off solved the problem. A little bit of head scratching at first, opening up in Firefox, I realized it worked. At first I thought it didn't support Chrome, which led to probably some of the people thinking it didn't because so many people do use this plugin. So hopefully Hopefully that helps someone solve some of those problems. Now, this is a more modern look of the interface, and I do like the new layout. I like the, you know, kind of friendly. I am currently power off that we have over here to see that the system's in a power off state. I just power cycled it, had it on and turned it back off. So you have the power consumption, which as this page refreshes, it'll go back down to zero. We have all the component info, CPU info, little green check boxes to tell us what's good, what's bad, all the system information, serial numbers, part numbers, and they give you a great amount of detail in here. Now with the system in a power state off, we're not gonna have much of the health status. So let's actually go ahead and hit power on, hit apply. It does this little flashy re retrying a couple times. Thought that was a little odd. I guess it just does that until it gets confirmation. If we go back over to the dashboard, we'll get a preview again. And I can actually hear it. Don't know the, the noise cancellation probably filters out, but I hear it on the other side in the other room. And now it's thinking about the power on cycle. You get a couple more of these retries. I just want to do this. This is real time on this part. Um, it, it does have this like pause when you first power it on. But once it's on, the interface goes back to working perfectly fine. The request configuration has been completed successfully. And now it's going through the boot process. Back over to the component info. Everything's green. And in a second, these will turn green as well. So it's going to get updated readings now that it's powered on. So I didn't have any errors in the health status, but it does show them red if it's powered off. But after it goes to the full boot cycle, everything turned green again, no problem. Uh, including once it boots up, it'll have the temperature of not only the onboard network card, but I thought it was interesting that the add-on 25 gig card, which granted, yes, it is a super micro card, the AOC S25G-M2S model, and that does also give me a temperature reading once it boots up. So we'll go ahead and let it boot a little further and get these readings refreshed. But while we're waiting, we can go through the configuration and account services, notifications, all the usual things that you have with the previous IPMI are all in this one. So you have the ability to push things even to a syslog server, which is I, really nice the way they have all this set up. It's an easy to use interface. I didn't really have any problems. The only thing I had overlooked originally was actually over on the component info, info was the fan speed is under advanced here. And I, if you leave it collapsed, you may not notice that you click the three dots to bring it out so you can change a couple different fan speeds. 
And here we can come back to seeing the network temperature on there. We don't have any GPU, so it doesn't display anything here, but I like that it has all these sensor readings. And among the interesting features is when you go to the full sensor reading right here, you can export these out to Excel, which I think is just kind of novel being able to throw all your sensor readings quickly into Excel. Uh, pretty neat that it's got that feature. Back on just to finish the remote configuration, the virtual media. So if you would like to completely manage this remotely, which is a very likely scenario, so you don't have access to the machine and you may not have access to necessarily put any USB that has different boot options on there so you can load different things to the system. It does have the option to do a shared host and a path to the image. So you can essentially load up a ISO server, some type of storage server maybe you have in your rack that could feed this and be able to completely reload it remotely. So they have this on here or uh, old school floppy images that uh, can be uploaded to the system itself. The last things we have on this part are the network control to set this however you want to manage your lights out. Management with the certificate, ports, access limitations, whether you want it to be DHCP or specify the IP address. For maintenance, they do have license activation, a reset, firmware management that can all be done right here. So if you want to update the firmware, that can pretty easily be done for the BMC, the BIOS, or the motherboard CPLD. So this is nice that they have all this right easy thing at your fingertips for remote management now let's see if this thing is booted up we're going to go ahead and launch the controller yes it is that's a nice feature is this html5 with the virtual keyboard made this really easy to manage and the recording feature that does claim not to be there when you use firefox and doesn't work is available though and you can record what's going on on a screen this is really good for being able to do tech support and as soon as you stop it it has a little WebM file that it creates and can play back for you if needed. So a really simple methodology for doing that. I like this feature on there uh, for being able to do the capture or even just do a screenshot and you have your power control, set power on, power off, reset, options, hot keys, full screen mode, uh, keyboard, mouse, hot plug. It does have mouse support, but the OS I have on here is not support mouse, so nothing I can do there. We're going to close this, though, because let's get to the testing in XCPNG. Now, I'm running the latest version of XCPNG 8.2, fully patched as of October of 2021. I did try TrueNAS Scale on this device because when I was doing some testing and some previous videos I can link to with TrueNAS Scale for performance, I was a little disappointed in performance. So I tried it on this system, and it still didn't perform really well. But XCPNG, no problem. And I figure a lot of people will probably want to look at this from a virtualization standpoint, and I do plenty of virtualization testing, and that's what this server's been doing for the last 30 days that it's been here. Of note, the Keoxia NVMe drives, the five of them, are set up in a ZFS RAID Z, just RAID Z1, so not too much redundancy. I wanted to see what kind of performance we can get out of there, and we're running all these VMs local to the system. So we're going to run a series of tests and just kind of show you the performance I was able to get with this basic load on this. So here's seven virtual machines and we'll go ahead and start them all at once. Are you sure you want to start seven VMs? I feel confident this system can handle seven VMs starting simultaneously. We have Windows Server 2019, a Windows Lab, a Windows Lab attached to the Server 2019 domain, just another Ubuntu server and Ubuntu server here. Now the Ubuntu servers, I have 64 processors assigned to each of them. That way, when we do some of the testing, we're going to test both of those simultaneously and see how they perform. And then over here on the Windows server, we've got 8x here. And then we're not going to do much with this. Matter of fact, let's have a little fun. So here's Windows. It's probably, yep, it's already booted. We're going to head and shut this Windows down and we're going to clone it. So we have a couple Windows servers running here. And each of these will have 32 cores as well. So go ahead and stop and clone. We'll make three more of them. We'll go ahead and fire up all three of these Windows servers here. There we go. Now we should see a little more usage if you look at the host. Eh, we're using about half of the 256 gigs of memory in this right here, but I'm sure it's going to have no problem running all these Windows servers or Windows uh, 10 labs at the same time. And we'll just call them all Windows 10 base clone. Actually, you probably give them a little bit better names here. Clone 1. So we have all those up and running now. So there's our Windows clones and our two Ubuntu lab servers. Let's kick these off, and I'm just going to run some random Pharonix tests on them, but we're going to SSH into each of these. So get the IP addresses. We'll run the Pharonix FIO.
and kick off some I.O. tests here. Uh, we don't need to save these results. Let's go ahead and get the IP address of the other lab server here so we can run at the same time. Nope. All right, so both of these are doing a bunch of heavy I.O. operations right now with that. Let's see how the disks are holding up. We'll let this run in the background. We'll look at some stats on here. They're just getting started right now at about 27,000 IOPS on the MVME. But after they start running, we'll see a little more. But why not stop there? And why stop there, I should say. And let's go ahead and go to the console on here. And uh, let's also go run some tests. We should run at least nine tests all. And uh, that's on the Windows Lab base. Let's go ahead on Clone 1 and run it over here. All. And uh, let's keep going. Clone 2. Let's just see how many of these we can get this system. Fully loaded on I.O. How much I.O. can it handle and still give us some type of performance numbers out of there. So this one's running. And that's that one. And finally, let's go back to 3. Someone will probably point out there's a lot of easier ways to do this. I know, but I'm having fun clicking through all these windows and turning this on. All right, now let's go ahead and see how that MVME is holding up. Go to our storage. All right, we've hit... Mm, we're at the 175,000 uh, read IOPS here. <laughs> It'll, uh, once we get to the right side of the test, we're going to see a little bit different side. I don't know if it's going to write quite as fast, but that's not bad. Um, that kind of IOPS performance out of these. So not bad at all here. Uh, and is it usable, I guess, is going to be the next question. So right here's my Kali Linux install. And can we do stuff in Kali? Kali seems to load perfectly fine. So uh, let's go ahead and run an update on there. Why not? It's very responsive. I can probably open up uh, different applications set up a few things, get stuff going on here. It's very responsive, even while at the same time, you go over here to the disk. They're all running on this same local MVME. And, oh, now we're in the 300,000 in the read IOPS on here. A couple notes though. One of the things you're gonna get some advantage on is having a ZFS and its ability to read and find common caching and be able to provide even better results when you're asking for some of the same things. And some people say caching may skew the benchmarks, but there are a lot of times when caching will actually help your overall performance. Well, should be all the time it helps whenever there's repetitive file operations. So it may skew the performance in some ways, but in other ways, it is actually providing a pretty real world knowing that it's turned on, you know, understanding of what's going on. Of note, and for those of you that aren't familiar with XCPNG, when you set up the ZFS on there. You do want to dedicate a little bit of extra memory to the control domain. And I've got that set at 32 gigs. This allows the ZFS caching to uh, be a little bit more effective. Now I do have net data installed on here. So let's actually see what we're doing for ZFS. And if I go here to ZFS file system, Here's our arc size, and about 16 gigs of arc. Arc on this, the adaptive read cache is caching on there. But we're not seeing, or we're seeing some good hits on here. So here's where we have the misses, and now we're seeing a lot of hits. So it's kind of giving us some really high numbers for the IOPS. Now, when a few minutes, we'll speed ahead and go to where we have the read side of these tests going. Because when the read side tests, obviously, you, uh, versus the write side test, you're going to see some different results. So once we speed past the read test and we see the write test, let's see how fast it can do there. All right, not bad. Even on the writes, we're hitting 282,000 uh, IOPS here. This was our read at 6.2. And our... 4.99, wow, or 4.89 yeah, for the right throughput. So that's that's some pretty impressive numbers we've seen on IO here. And we did see a little bit of latency, but not anything terrible because as I said, you know, we can go back over here like my Kali Linux, which hey, it looks like that's some updates. We'll go ahead and say yes. Everything's still very responsive, working perfectly fine. I'm not really seeing any issues with the systems. All of them are running fine on here. 
I can probably go through and even do a few things in the Windows Server Lab as well. And uh, you can see, you'll see. All right, yeah, we logged into this. It's completely responsive and working fine while all this other stuff's going on in the background. We'll jump back over to the disks. And they're running some of the smaller writes, which don't need is quite as many doesn't really push it to a higher level of iops on here now the last thing we want to test and this is going to be a little bit trickier to test but i'm sure we can pull it off here is let's go ahead and run some stress testing and what we're going to do is log in here and we'll kick off stress and what this is going to do is tell it to consume 64 processors, load them up with gibberish for the next 300 seconds. So I'll kick that off, which will send the server into some angry. Pretty sure that I can hear it. I know the staff in the other room are probably wondering what all that noise is. We'll run a performance test simultaneously with this virtual machine here. And by the way, the other benchmarks, the Pharaonix ones, are still running in the background here. So we're still doing disk IO tests. We'll continue and we're going to go ahead and run all the CPU tests. So it's now running CPU tests on this particular system here. Let's go ahead and do it on clone two. Do the same thing again. And you're seeing the performance numbers are still reasonable. This thing is still very responsive. It's still working. Kick off pass mark again. Continue, run, yes, yes. So we're running a couple dual CPU tests while also running stress. We'll go back over here to the host. And it's just a wall of processor running right now. And it's kicked up the fans. I can hear it in, in the other room bleeding through a little bit. And uh, But the system is running perfectly fine. It's still handling it, and we'll see what the processor results come back to. So all that's running, and simultaneously how the Supermicro handles the storage. So let's go over here at the storage stats. Yep, still no problems. Still relatively low I.O. wait time for the particular runs it's running. Of course, now I only have the Linux VMs really doing the I.O. Uh, I just have CPU tests running on a couple of those Windows machines. And, of course, we still have my Kali Linux. It's probably still loading a few updates. Yep. Let's see if there's any more. But overall, as you can see, this is very responsive, and that was kind of the goal, is to make sure that it doesn't have any problems handling all this. It was kind of no doubt that it would, but I thought this was kind of a fun way to demonstrate some of that in the video here. So this one's completed. Here's my CPU versus the world on clone one. I think we ran it again on clone two. Yeah, still almost done. Almost done here. Kicked off a few seconds later. This one's even better because it finished after that was done. And let's go back and see if this is still running over here. We'll go ahead and stop stress from running. So the system will go back down to normal. But even with that running, sucking up 64 cores, had no problem multitasking all of them. Now, I know some of you that play around with this stuff all the time or use a lot of enterprise hardware probably aren't surprised at all about the performance of the machine. But I wanted to demonstrate, you know, running XCPNG, my hypervisor of choice, which, by the way, I'll leave a link to all my XCPNG tutorials on here. Everything I was running here at the Zen Orchestra, the XCPG is fully open source, so you can run all these same tests on whatever hardware you may have. But overall, I want to thank Supermicro for sending us out for review. We used it for uh, a handful of little projects we had around here. We wanted to do a series of testing, and it's just important impressive how fast we were able to get some of these things set up on there uh, from loading things, some of the operating system testing we did. So overall, I do like the server. Uh, I'll leave links to the Supermicro website where you can check it out. I have no affiliate codes. This was not sponsored by them. This was just a review unit that I do have to send back. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. To hire a share project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click on the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a Join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the descriptions of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts and new designs come out, well, randomly. So check back frequently.
And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, check out some of our other videos. Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and this is a Super Micro. But let's jump right into the uh, specific hay fins.